Years back, there used to be car a cartoon called Dennis the Menace. And in this cartoon, uh, Dennis was uh, standing in front of his parents' door. It was shut. And he had his little onesie jammies on, and it was unsnapped. And uh, his pampers were, you know, wet and sagging. Uh, he had his little teddy bear, the nose was torn off, and uh, the one eye that still had a button on it was dangling. And he read this note that his mom had hung on the door, uh, uh, closed for the day, motherhood out of order. This is the 14th week in our series, Fixer Upper, and 14 weeks ago, we started this uh, the day after uh, Easter, maybe you felt like that mother, like you're just exhausted, uh, you know, out of order, uh, your spirit was sagging, uh, you weren't experiencing the joy and happiness that God has designed for Christ followers to experience. But now, hopefully, through this series, you found from the Apostle Paul's uh, teaching to the Philippians that happiness and joy can be ours if we learn to think better. Paul organizes the book, Philippians, around five wrong ways of thinking and five right ways of thinking. I've shared with you these several times. Let's go over it one more time. The first wrong way to think is to think that your circumstances dictate your happiness. In other words, if things aren't going well with you health-wise, or you're having some problems at school or at work or in your family, you think, well, of course I'm unhappy. Why wouldn't I be? Paul says, no. Your circumstances don't have to dictate. Paul was in prison in Rome facing trial and execution. Yet he talked about joy over and over again. He says the key to joy is to focus on Jesus. You keep your focus on Him and that God exists and that He loves you and that He's all-powerful and He can change any circumstance. Of these five, this is the most important theme. The second wrong way to think is to think people cause my problems. You say, that's right. I've got people at school, kids are going back to school, they're so annoying. I've got a teacher who's so bad. My parents are so strict. My sibling is so annoying. People say and do such stupid things. Of course, I have every reason to be mad. Paul says, no, that's the wrong way to think. The right way to think is to think of people as being more important than yourselves. You view people as uh, people made in the image of God, and they are, uh, if you view them that way, you don't have to be unhappy when they do stupid things. Third wrong way to think is to think negatively. My guess is most of us, when something happens, we go negative pretty quickly. Paul says, don't do that. Instead, rejoice in the Lord. Instead, praise. Get a practice of not going negative anytime something happens, but to praise God. Fourth wrong way to think is to worry. Just a couple days ago, I told Jory about five or six things that are worrying me. Even though I just gave a message about worry a couple weeks ago, I have things that cause me worry. But Paul says that's not the right way to think. Instead, when you worry... Stop and say, God, I don't want to do this. Instead, turn it into a prayer. You say, God, I'm worried that this will happen. Would you please help this not to happen? Instead, could you see that this happened? Could you in your mercy help this to happen? Then the final wrong way to think is to be discontented with what you have, with where you are. And the right way to think is contentment. Today, I want to look at this final way to happiness, discontentment. If you always think there's something new that you could buy, and then you'll be happy, you'll never be happy. We are the most marketed to culture in history. Think how many ads you receive on your phone every day. You don't ask for them, they just come. 
Think how many ads you see on TV. The essence of the ads are to make you dissatisfied with what you have so that you'll want to buy the product they want to sell. The most persistent and sophisticated marketing in our culture is reserved for children. Think about how profitable holidays have become. Americans spent $8 billion on Halloween in 2013. I mean, whatever happened to wearing old clothes and putting on a mask? I mean, Halloween has become an industry. Teenager, if you think new stuff is what funds your happiness, you're going to be a rat on a wheel for the rest of your life. You'll be going around and around, always trying to get something new to bring you happiness. More stuff does not make you happy. Learning contentment isn't about age. I know 18-year-olds who get this. I know 48-year-olds who do not. Contentment isn't a money issue. It's a heart issue. Parents, you have to prepare your kids to defend themselves against the thinking that more stuff will bring them happiness. It won't. Think about it. When we give in to the marketing that more stuff will bring us happiness, we end up buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. I mean, it's nuts. The next thing never satisfies. We push back from the Thanksgiving table. We pat our round bellies. Within a few hours, we're back in the kitchen picking meat off the bone. We take the vacation of a lifetime. We plan it for years. We save for years. Then off we go. We satiate ourselves with sun, fun, and food. And before it's even over, we're dreading going back into real life. And we're planning another one. We're not satisfied. As a child, we say, if only I were a teenager, then I'd be happy. And as a teenager, we say, if only I were an adult, then I'd be happy. As an adult, we say, if only I were married, then I'd be happy. As a married, we say, if only we had a baby, then I'd be happy. As a parent, we say, if only my kids were grown, Then with an empty house, if only my kids would visit more often. Then as we get older and sit in a rocking chair with aching joints, we say, if only I were a child. We're not satisfied. Contentment is a difficult virtue. Turn to our text today in your Bible, Philippians 4, 10 to 23. We do have Bibles under the seats. It's on page 1,181. Read with me what the Apostle writes in Philippians 4, 11 to 12. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. The circumstances of Paul's situation were miserable. He's writing this from a jail cell in Rome. He's facing trial before Emperor Nero, which will he knows has every chance of ending up in execution. And that's exactly the way we believe that Paul died. Yet with shackles dangling from his wrists, He writes, I have learned the secret of being content. Paul's use of the term secret is curious. He doesn't say, I've learned the principle. He says, I've learned the secret 
of being content. Secret, by definition, is a bit of knowledge not commonly known. It's as if the apostle beckons us to lean forward and he whispers, can I share with you a secret about happiness? Does your happiness depend on what you drive, what you wear, what you deposit? If so, you've entered the rat race called materialism. You cannot win it. There will always be another car to buy, another dress to purchase. The cycle's predictable. You assume if I get a car, I'll be happy. Then the car gets older and loses its pizzazz, and you have to look elsewhere for joy. You say, if I get married, then I'll be happy. And then your mate doesn't deliver. You say, if only I could have a baby, then I'll be happy. If I could just get a new job, that would do it. If I can retire, then I'll be happy. In each case, the joy diminishes, and you have to look elsewhere. What's Paul's secret? Paul shows us that contentment brings happiness. I find three things that Paul teaches us about finding contentment. One, focus more on what you have and less on what you don't have. Psychologists tried an experiment with children. They put a group of children in a room with toys, and these toys were unusual. They were all broken. So, the cars had wheels missing, the, the dolls had limbs broken off, yet the kids played happily all morning. The next day, they had the same children, they put them in the same room with the same toys, but this time, they opened the curtains and they had a window they could see through another group of children playing with toys, but these children's toys were all brand new, perfect. This time, the children with the broken toys, didn't, didn't, they didn't have any fun. Most of them stood at the window and cried. What made the difference? They focused on what they didn't have instead, on what they, instead of what they had. Paul learned to be content with what he had, which is remarkable because he had so little. He had a jail cell instead of a house. He had chains instead of jewelry. He had a guard instead of a wife. How could he be content? Simple. He focused on a different list. He focused that he had a Savior who loved him, who died on the cross for him. He had forgiveness of sins. If he didn't get out of jail and he was executed, he knew he had the hope of eternal life with God in heaven. He focused on what he had in Christ being far greater than what he didn't have. Paul gives us the same advice elsewhere. He says to Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. In Hebrews 13.5, we read, we're not sure who wrote Hebrews. Could have been Luke. Could have been Apollos. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Contentment is being content with what we have. Two, put your confidence in God's unfailing provision. Paul was able to be content because he believed that God would provide for him. He didn't put his confidence in what he had but in God. Contentment is choosing to get off the rat race of always having to be, have more to be happy. Look what Solomon writes in Proverbs 23. Read this with me. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. 
Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. I told you last week that I memorized 73 Proverbs during uh, the five weeks I was gone, and this was one of them. Um, don't put your trust in riches just when you think you have enough. They'll fly off to the sky like an eagle. You have to put your trust in God providing. There are 104 verses in Philippians. Guess how many times Paul mentions Jesus? 40 times. So every 2.5 verses, he mentions Jesus. He mentions joy 19 times. So every five verses. Put the two together and you get the theme of this book. Put rejoice in the Lord. You don't just try to be happy, but you rejoice that God exists, that He's in control. You want to memorize the verse? Okay, here we go. Uh, I'll, memorizing verses is not that hard. Now, this one's particularly short, but uh, you just break it up into segments and you build on each one. So here, you just repeat after me. I can do all this through Him. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Now, don't look at the screen. I can do all this, I'll say it first, I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. See, not that hard. Paul believed that Christ would give him the strength to face jail, execution, trial, whatever. Enough strength to get him through. In Philippians 4.19, he says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Paul believed that God would meet all of his needs so he could be content. I've shared this with you before, but when I went to graduate school, I was a poor man. My parents helped me with college. I was on my own for graduate school. I worked at a church here in Portland in the summer. They paid me quite well. I worked for Young Life during the school year. They paid me quite well. But every penny went for seminary. Then I met Jory. We decided to get married. I had to buy a ring, and I had to pay for a honeymoon. By the time I had paid for the honeymoon, my account was zero. And I got a... We went to Maui for our honeymoon. We had a great time, but I got our hotel on for cheap on the Kahului side. If you've ever been to Maui, you know that nobody stays uh, by the airport. So we were kind of in a hovel. Sure, I'd never seen anything so sparse. And uh, um, every day we'd get up and we'd go across to Kanapali or Wailea. We'd be on one of the beaches there, one of the fancy hotels. We'd shower in their hotels. We'd get dressed in their bathrooms. And then we'd eat somewhere, and then we'd go back to our hovel. Now, don't get me wrong. We had a great time, but I was poor. But I remember all through those three years, each month, carefully writing out my tithe to give back to God the first tenth of what I earned. Do you know something? I got through graduate school debt-free. And I believe that it had something to do with God seeing, liking the way I was handling my finances, and trusting Him to give to Him first, that He helped me get through that. Now, sometimes things don't work out so well, Hard as you try to make things work, things seem to just kind of not work. They almost work in reverse. The harder you try to correct them, the worse they get. A fellow by the name of R.D. Jones had this happen to him. Uh, the problem that happened to him wasn't catastrophic. He wasn't diagnosed with cancer. 
He didn't fall off a cliff. His car didn't drop in a sinkhole due to an earthquake. His problem was simply typographical errors in his local newspaper. Monday, for sale. R.D. Jones has one sewing machine for sale. Phone 503-948-0707 after 7 p.m. and ask for Mrs. Kelly, who lives with him cheap. <laughs> Tuesday. We regret having aired in R.D. Jones' ad yesterday. It should have read, one sewing machine for sale, cheap. Phone 503-948-0707 and ask for Mrs. Kelly, who lives with him after 7 p.m. Wednesday. R.D. Jones has informed us that he's received several annoying telephone calls because of the error we made in his classified ad yesterday. The ad stands correct as follows. For sale, R.D. Jones has one sewing machine for sale, cheap. Phone 503-948-0707 after 7 p.m. and ask for Mrs. Kelly, who loves with him. <laughs> Thursday, I, R.D. Jones, have no sewing machine for sale. I smashed it. <laughs> Don't call 948-0707 as the telephone has been yanked out. <laughs> I have not been carrying on with Mrs. Kelly until yesterday she was my housekeeper, but she quit. <laughs> Incredible that you can have one typographical error after another and to have that big of a mess. But sometimes that's the way life goes. Things happen with your health. School, work, your family. And when that happens, how do you find joy? How do you experience contentment? Well, one Paul says, focus on what you have rather than what you don't have. Two, put your confidence in God's provision. And three, this one may surprise you, give generously to God. Generosity takes greed away from us. It breaks discontentment. Paul tells about the generosity of the Philippians. Philippians 4.14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. The Philippians shared in Paul's troubles in Rome, in a jail cell, by supporting him financially. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, Macedonia is where Philippi is, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. They were brand new Christians. The general rule is that when people become Christians, become new Christians, you don't expect them to give for a while. It may take months. When people come to a church newly, they don't give for a while. But they gave as soon as they came to Christ. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. The Thessalonians had a lot more money than the Philippians. The Philippians could have thought, well... We don't need to give to Paul. He's in Thessalonica. They're loaded. But instead, they gave regularly to Paul. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is more, that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. We met Epaphroditus early in, earlier in this series. He was the, the Philippian in the church there who brought the gift to Paul in Rome. There he worked for the church in Rome that had been planted and worked so hard that he became deathly ill and nearly died. Here's the way most people handle their finances. Most people's first priority is there is live, their living expenses. Then after they've paid for all their living expenses, they save if there's anything left over. And then uh, if there's anything left over after that, then they give to God. 
So a typical month, I say, well, I don't have enough to save this month. And sorry, God, it's all gone. God flips that whole paradigm on its head. He says, here's God's, here's my principles. Give first. Throughout the Bible, we're told to give to God the first part of our income. Look at what Solomon writes. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So the biblical teaching is to give back to God the first tenth of all that you earn. Then your barns, there's a promise, will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Then your second priority is to be to say is to save. Dave Ramsey in Financial Peace suggests you put away 15% for long-term saving. If you start that practice at age 25, you will have plenty of money at age 65. Then your third priority is to live. Even without living, you're supposed to save for things you're going to buy. You save up so you can buy a car with cash. You save up so you can buy furniture with cash. You save up so you can buy a ring with cash. You save up so you go on a vacation with cash. If you're living this way, you've already given to God, you've already saved, then you can live freely and live on the rest. The Philippians gave generously to God to support Paul, and it gave them great joy, and it gave Paul great joy. It gave them great contentment, and Paul experienced contentment. Contentment brings happiness. Why don't you say that with me? This is my point today. Contentment brings happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. You want to be happy. I want to be happy. So let's practice contentment this week. Deal? Father, thank you for your word, that it is true, that every word in the Bible is inspired by you, in this case, through Paul. And you've taught us today that contentment is the way to joy. When we're discontent, always thinking we have to buy something more and then we'll be happy, it'll never happen. And so we want to practice contentment this week. I'd like you to pray. Why don't you start by telling God what makes you discontent? Maybe what, what is it you think will make you happy if you could have that? Why don't you confess that? And then tell Him you want to practice contentment this week. Contentment with where you are right now, with what you have right now. You pray. Thank you, God, for your word. We do want to be happy. And we see that contentment with what we have and where we are is the way to experience that. So help us to practice that this week. We need your help to do it, though, Lord. Every time we start getting discontented, may we turn to you and express gratitude for where we are right now, what we have. In Jesus' name.